Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Living Life Naturally podcast. I am, of course, your host, Lynn Wadsworth. So thrilled to have you here with us. And welcome to this week's topic when I talk to Relationship Diversity podcast and coach and mentor, Carrie Giroslo. And today we're going to talk a little bit about relationships in midlife. And so we're super thrilled to have Carrie with us. And let me tell you a little bit about her today. She is an international best-selling author, an intuitive and conscious relationship coach. She teaches people the tools to relate consciously to themselves and to others, and she believes that we learn and accept who we truly are as being a part of our our progress in life. And when we do that, we can be more authentic in our relationships with others. So this authentically brings an unparalleled sense of joy, joyfulness and fulfillment to our lives as a whole. So in 2022, she began her podcast, which I mentioned, Relationship Diversity Podcast, uh, where it's her aim to explore, question, and celebrate all aspects of relationship structure diversity, from sologamory to monogamy to polyamory and everything in between. So This is an inclusive space giving people the permission to design their unique relationships from the knowledge and acceptance of their unique selves. She's also been seen on NBC, PBS, The CW. She's been featured in Forbes, Thrive Global, Winston-Salem Journal, Prevention and Newsweek, and she's been interviewed by Marion Williamson, Go All In TV. The List TV and many others to discuss the ideas in her coaching as well as in her first book, Why Do They Always Break Up With Me? So welcome to our podcast. I'm so thrilled to have you here today, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me, Lynn. So tell our listeners uh, where you're joining us from. Yes, I am in the foothills of North Carolina in the U.S., and uh, enjoying a beautiful fall. Uh, I would imagine your leaves are beginning to turn a little. Yes, they are just turning, and uh, we are getting quite a spectacle outside of our windows right now. That's awesome. Of course, here in Florida, we get no spectacle like that. (laughs) All we get is In the winter, we get dead leaves all over the grass, so (laughs) not quite so much fun. Right. But nevertheless, um, if we're going to talk about relationships today and specifically relationships for women who are in midlife. So just give us a bit of background and tell us a little bit about your own journey and your own personal story. Yeah. Well, you know, relationships were always really, really tough for me. That's why I wrote the book, Why Do They Always Break Up With Me? Because Mm -hmm. that was pretty much the experience that I had for maybe the first half of my life. Um, I am a child of divorced parents and my father had an affair. And so when I was 12, which was, you know, a really big time Mm -hmm. in my development in terms of relationships, And so I ended up recreating that a lot in my uh, late teens, early adulthood, and did a lot of internal processing and work through different therapies to help heal that belief that men always left me. And so I thought I was rewarded with all my work when I met my first husband And we were married for six years and we had a beautiful friendship. However, we did not have a very strong um, sexual experience. And so at the time that I met him, it wasn't super important. However, over the years, it became more important to both of us. And so he was the one that asked for a divorce. So there I was again. Um, He left me. I mean, it was more, I would say, more compassionate uncoupling, but 
I still felt like I was in the same experience. And so at that point I had pretty much the biggest healing that I've ever had, where I really started to look at my relationship with my father and healed that with a modality called theta healing. And that was about mm -hmm. three months of incredibly um, deep and beautiful and permanent healing so much so that right after that, I started developing and kind of, you know, attracting different kinds of men and had really in beautiful experiences, um, ultimately leading to my relationship with my current husband in 2005. And so we have been married for we got married when I was about 37 and we started having children at 38 when I was 38 and, you know, had just a, a really beautiful marriage, albeit with, you know, all the pressures and stresses that come with uh, very busy, full lives. We're both creatives and like to, you know, always be continually evolving in terms of our businesses and our relationships. We ended up having another child in 2013 and uh, in 2020 was when we decided that we were going to explore dynamics in our relationship structure. And uh, we opened up our relationship and it's really been an incredible experience and, and really quite a rebirth for me in this, you know, perimenopausal menopausal time in my life. It has been an awakening, a rebirthing of me as a woman. And uh, it's been it's been quite an adventure and a really good adventure, definitely with some struggles and challenges. But that's pretty much will be anything with life. Mm -hmm. You know, life mm -hmm. presents challenges and it's how I think you address them and, and what you do with those challenges that determines what your experience is. So that's a basic gist of mm -hmm. my relationship experience. So I know that when we get to, to midlife, so for some of us, we've been married a long time. Um, for others, maybe they, they've struggled with, maybe they've had a few husbands by now. <clears throat> but nevertheless, it comes to, <clears throat> here we go, that Florida stuff again. Um, mm -hmm. We come to a time in our life when we begin to to question, to to wonder, or to realize that things are a li little different. Mm -hmm. Many times for us, our kids have left home. And so here we are with this man that we chose to spend our lives with. And it's almost like building a relationship again. Um, so how, how do you think that this time in a woman's life um, affects our intimate relationships? Yeah, that is, that's a great question, Lynn. I think that the most important relationship is going to be the relationship with self. And we are continually evolving as people. So if we are continually evolving and our partners are continually evolving, the, the best case scenario is to evolve together, right? Is to grow together and to, to reconnect, especially like when children leave the household, there is this time of reconnection and self-reconnection and then reconnection with partner. And to see if that is really something that is possible, if something that's desired by both people so what I like to suggest to people, and this is how I reconnected with myself, because I had a child at 38 and having children later in life, you know, I had already, I was very um, clear in my professional endeavors and goals and who I was. And I spent a lot of time in my own um, development of, of my connection to my spirituality, to who I really am. So when I had children that late, that was really a big shift for me. And, and then I had another child at 43. So, um, all natural. Um, and 
And so in that, in those first, I would say five years of the, of my first child's life until he got to kindergarten, I felt really lost. I was just in a state of survival, which I know a lot of people, a lot of women Ooh. can really identify with this feeling of like, I just need to do the best I can to get my child everything that they need and sacrifice my sleep and sacrifice my health to just make sure my child is safe and is growing up in, you know, the healthiest environment possible. So what happened when my youngest went to kindergarten, I realized that I had completely lost myself. I didn't know who I was. And so I decided that I was going to start a daily self-care practice. I talk about self-care as reconnection to self. Self-care is not about, it could be about a massage or a nice meal or a pedicure, but it's really to me about committing to healthy, healthy in terms of like mental health, things I love mm -hmm. to do that I can do every day and doing a super minimal practice. So I decided I was going to do three minutes of yoga a day. I love yoga. I connect with myself in yoga. It helps me mind, body, and spirit. So I started that self-care practice and have done it every single day for seven years, just finishing my seventh year. And that I've noticed in the first six months started to get me to understand who I was now as a mother of two, as a business owner, as a wife, like who really am I? Who am I? What are my desires? What do I want in life? And recalibrate where, where I am that started everything for me that started like everything in this phase of my life. And when I go through challenging times, I go on my yoga mat, maybe just stretch for three minutes. But again, it's about reconnecting and finding these ways that I can check in with myself. How am I really doing? How am I really feeling? If I were to push out everything else in my life, what do I really think? about what's going on. That doesn't mean that I don't take into account other people. It's just, I understand what I desire and want first and foremost. And I think a lot of women, not all, but a lot of women sacrifice their de desires and wants for a lot of other people. And so I feel like this time of perimenopause, menopause is like a reclamation. If you look at it that way, right? If you look at it in a way of like, oh my God, here I am, I'm aging. This is really bad. I'm different. My body feels different. Well, then you kind of go down the rabbit hole of yeah. this being a bad yeah. experience, right? But if you look at it as like, this is a way, a time for me to reinvent myself, then it can be very empowering. Yeah, I think that you hit the nail on the head because I think that we come to that phase in midlife where we've put our kids first, we put our families first, and that's where the struggle is with trying to figure out who we are. And I think that that's where the term probably for men, midlife crisis comes in because they're trying to reevaluate. For a woman, we reevaluate a little differently. But I, I would say that even now, one of my biggest struggles is finding what it is in my self-care routine that's actually fun. I mm. feel that a lot of the fun has gone because, you know, I was in a corporate job. I Everything was always so serious. Um, being British, my husband couldn't deal with my sense of humor. And so I had to kind of reinvent who I was so I couldn't just spontaneously be who I was in my humor. So there was a point in my life where, where you might say the rubber hits the road and you, you have to really begin to go internally and figure out, well, who am I? What am I doing here? How can I best reconnect with myself, as you're saying? Yes, yes, absolutely. And I, I have this course on my website. It's called Self-Care Made Easy. It's a super inexpensive course, but it's really the steps that I took to create this really sacred time for myself every single day. And there are days that I have gone on my yoga mat. That's just for me, but to, and I've cried. And there are times when I go there and I resist it. 
but there's also more times than not that I feel supported, that I feel like this is the time that I do every single day to just for me. And I talk about self-care in that way, that if it's, if, if it's something that doesn't bring you happiness, it is not in my definition of mm-hmm. self-care. And also that we, we tend to complicate things um, in that, you know, I remember before I started this self-care practice, I always thought my yoga isn't yoga unless I go to a class that's 45 minutes long. And I could never find the time to go to a class for 45 yeah. minutes. So I was like, there's gotta be an easier way. So I talk about self-care in the terms of like, well, maybe it's you singing a song once a day that you really love, or maybe it's in you going on a walk and like purposely looking at the different colors of the leaves on the trees. Maybe it is a two minute gratitude practice. You know, we, we can simplify it in order to feel like we are successful at it. Because if we if we aim too high too soon, then we will feel unsuccessful if we don't get it. And then we'll just be like, we'll just give up on our self-care. But if we make it super accessible, super easy, then we'll tend to show up, you know, more and more every day. And so that's what that program is. It is called Self-Care Made Easy. And you can get it on my website. Mm-hmm. That, that's so very true, because one of the things I hear so many times when it comes to taking care of yourself is, you know, a woman's really quick to say, but I don't have time. And, you know, this is what I also try to teach. I mean, it can be 60 seconds of breathing. It can be 30 seconds of imagining yourself in the most beautiful place you like to be. It can be something so simple, soaking in a bathtub. We yeah. don't have to look at all these lofty goals out there. I, I mean, you, you're just so right about that. And we we complicate so many things in our life. And when we go back to that simplification, then it can, it can cause us to be so much more successful in what we're trying to achieve. Definitely. Definitely. And, you know, when we start something new, it is a little bit uncomfortable, right? Because we're, we're developing these new, you know, pathways in, in not only in our brain, but also in the way that we show up. And we also, I think it's important to look at sometimes when we want to commit to something that's good for us, you know, is there anything within us that's, that's scared? to do that, to do something good for us, whether it's a feeling that we aren't worthy of that, we're not good enough. You know, there are these sneaky ways that we will sabotage, do self-sabotage and keep ourselves from really seeing what's going on from a place of protection. And and that's totally, I understand that, right? It's hard to, mm-hmm. to, to look at something within us that we're scared to see and we will, we will self-preserve and, and protect ourselves. Um, So it's about kind of getting under some of those maybe deeper beliefs that will keep us from showing up for ourselves every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you throw aging into the mix as a woman where we find that so, so difficult. Um, What are your thoughts on on the aging process and Mm -hmm. how it can how we can use it to reconnect with ourselves? Yeah. Aging is very humbling right? It's humbling to look in the mirror and see lines that maybe you've never seen before and skin that isn't maybe as taut and, you know, maybe a little bit of added weight in places that were never an issue before. And I kind of look at this time like I did childbirth or or pregnancy. I loved pregnancy. I loved being pregnant because I shifted my belief pretty early on in my pregnancy journey from, oh my gosh, my body feels so different and it feels uncomfortable and it feels different to finding what I loved about it and then doubling down on that feeling. So what I loved about being pregnant was that it was a very in beautiful time that was just with for me and and the baby that I was carrying. It was just our time together. 
And yes, my body was changing. I was super sick for the first five months. Mm. Um, but I kept, I kept focusing on the feeling of that intimacy between me and the baby. And so I brought that idea into this perimenopausal menopausal journey. And instead of focusing on all the things that were hard to look at or hard to accept um, and, you know, the, the changes that were happening in my body, <coughs> excuse me, I did my best to focus on what was really beautiful. Um, for me, after I turned 50, I cared less about what other people mm. thought of and this was like, this was, that was really empowering because I spent a lot of my life caring what other people thought of me. And it ended up disempowering me to such a degree that I got to the place that I didn't know who I was. And I judged myself because I wasn't like everyone else. And so after 50, I was just kind of like, well, this is who I am. And I just started to fall in love with who I was and focus on what was what I loved doing and what I felt like I was good at. Like I wasn't great with my children when they were babies only because it felt uncomfortable. And I just didn't I, I, I wanted to have these deeper conversations with my children. So as we grew, as they grew up. I realized that that's where my favorite part of mothering was, was having conversations with them about their dreams, their desires, what they loved, how they connected with their friends, what, you know, what they wanted to do in life or do in that moment. That's where we really connected. And so focusing on what I loved instead of focusing on what I wasn't enjoying and then coming to a place of acceptance. So maybe I have a mantra of, you know, yeah, I see those lines above my eyes right here and that's hard for me and that's okay. It's okay for it to be hard for me, but I also really do love myself. I love who I am and I'm going to continually evolve and grow and, you know, heal and love who I am. And so accepting that it is both humbling and challenging and also really beautiful at the same time and that those things can coexist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we tend to go through midlife so down on ourselves. And I know, I know I've gone through that and gone through that <clears throat> chasing after the dream of, of who I was, what I looked like, and, you know, the more I've taken care of myself um, and the more I practice self-care and put into my own life some of the practices you've been talking about, my skin looks better and better all the time. I, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it definitely can come from the inside out. It can come from our attitude and mindset and how we take care of ourselves. Yes, all of those things. Absolutely. I think it is both an in, I think it is a, it starts from definitely the in, internal work. And that's, you know, people say to me, you don't look like you're 53. And I say, I partly it is genetics because my family, mm. you know, they, they, that is part of what it is. But at the same time, I am, my goal in life is to continually evolve and to heal. And so I will pull myself out of, you know, certain priorities that might have been a priority in terms of my business or, you know, obligations to do my healing work when I need to. And I think that that is really the biggest part of aging and about falling in love with yourself and continually falling in love with yourself um, in, in really a way that is true in the belief that I am good enough and worthy enough to love myself, to be loved and to, you know, be in the world to me in a way that I will help people, which was, is what I hope that my podcast brings is a different way of looking at relationships. Mm -hmm. And so wh where is the best place for people to find you? Yeah. The best place is through relationshipdiversitypodcast.com. You'll learn, you'll be able to connect 
to my podcast. I have a link to go to my first podcast uh, episode, which I did over a year ago. And that one really explains what relationship diversity is, because what I say relationship is, relationship diversity is, is about knowing who you are to know what you want, Mm -hmm. that you are a unique person and your partner is a unique person. So the equation is unique person plus unique person equals unique relationship. Yet what we do all the time is that we try and fit our relationships in a box. Mm -hmm. And so definitely go check out that first episode. I also have a free guide for relationship diversity for exploring it for yourself. You can get that by signing up uh, right on that website and you'll get that sent right to you. Yeah. And that will all be in the show notes. And so do you have any parting thoughts or words of wisdom that you'd like to, to share? Yeah. Well, I'll kind of reiterate what I said about this time. It is such a beautiful time of rebirth of evolution of stepping into the truth of who you are because i think that at this time there is less care about what others say and i would love to to encourage anyone who's listening to really go inward and look at who you want to be who you truly are and how you want to show that into the world and bring that into the world in this phase of your life, to not look at it as something that is is a bad thing, is the end, too late to do anything, Mm -hmm. you know, is to look at it is as this beautiful opportunity to be who you are in the world. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Carrie. I appreciate you being here with us today. And I'll be sure to have all of your links in the show notes so that people can take advantage of what you have to offer. And I appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you so much, Lynn, for having me. You have been listening to the Living Life Naturally podcast, where we're on a mission to inform, inspire, and encourage women to live their best life confidently, joyfully, and freely from what's been holding them back. For show notes and free resources, visit holistic-healthandwellness.com. And I'd be delighted if you'd follow us on socials to connect further. If you enjoyed this show, why not share it with your friends? If you found good value, chances are they will too. And of course, a five-star review on iTunes is always greatly appreciated as much as I appreciate you listening. So until next time, Live life naturally and joyfully.